to do the, the introduction. I want to do the introduction. Uh, Professor Fox is a professor in the math department at, at Stanford University. His research interests include uh, extremal combinatorics, graph theory, combinatorial geometry, applications of combinatorics to computer science. I think that he is one of the most important researchers in his field in the world. Uh, he has published more than 130 papers in the most important journals in this field with close to 1,500 sites. Uh, it's a great pleasure for us that he's presenting this talk in the MCA conference, uh, Substitutions. Thanks a lot, Jacob. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, uh, yeah, so I'm be talking about uh, problems around subset sums, which on the surface look very elementary, but then uh, there's some very uh, uh, interesting mathematics that goes behind this. Um, this is based on joint work with um, uh, David Conlin, who's a professor at Caltech, and Hoi Twen, uh, Twen Pham, who's a PhD student at Stanford, uh, working with me. Um, uh, so subset sums, uh, problems around subset sums go back uh, hundreds, if not uh, <laughs> thousands of years. Um, and there's some very famous problems around subset sums in number theory, including Goldbach's conjecture that every even integer at least four is the sum of two primes. Um, and uh, this is a page from uh, Goldbach's uh, work where he states this conjecture. Um, another uh, famous, now this is a theorem of uh, Gauss's is his Eureka theorem that every positive integer is the sum of three triangular numbers. And this is from uh, Gauss's journal on this where he uh, said Eureka, <laughs> and you can see uh, um, in the middle of the page there that, that uh, he observed that uh, every positive integer is the sum of three triangular numbers. This is not, of course, the proof, but he, he realized it's true um, here. Now, uh, these uh, famous results and, and, uh, and problems, um, uh, they go back a long time and they're about representing integers as the sum of a small number of uh, elements from a special sequence. In the first case, we were looking at uh, prime numbers, in this case, triangular numbers. There are many other examples like Lagrange's um, four square theorem or Waring's theorem about higher powers. Um, but there are still many questions about representing uh, by an arbitrary number of elements from distinct elements from a set. And this is what uh, complete sequences are about. So uh, let A be a sequence of positive integers. Um, and sigma of A is the set of integers representable as the sum of distinct terms of A. Um, and uh, the set A is said to be complete if every sufficiently large integer is in sigma of A. And entirely complete if every positive integer is in sigma of A. Um, and so some basic examples, if you take powers of two, um, then because you can write every positive integer in base two, uh, it's an entirely complete sequence. Um, every positive integer can be represented as a sum of distinct elements that are powers of two. On the other hand, if you just distinct, if you just delete one element from the sequence, um, then it's not uh, even complete. In fact, you can only represent the even numbers. Um, and so this notion of completeness is rather fragile. Um, and so uh, it'd be nice if there was a more uh, robust notion and we'll come to one soon. Um, now, another interesting example of Sprague is that the kth powers of positive integers is a complete sequence that every sufficiently po large positive integer can be represented as a sum of, uh, of distinct perfect kth powers. Um, this doesn't immediately follow from Waring's theorem because in Waring's theorem, you're allowed to use the same integer more than once um, uh, in the sum. Uh, and a, a more interesting example is uh, this result of Birch that if you take uh, co-prime positive integers, P and Q, that are at least two, uh, and you take 
the powers of P and the powers of Q and multiply them, then that sequence, um, which is rather sparse um, up to N, there's roughly log N squared of them, um, uh, is it's it's a complete sequence, um, and uh, that's a, Birch's proof is is constructive. There were later proofs that uh, use, were very nice analytic proofs that um, uh, that were non-constructive. Um, now those examples we said earlier showed earlier were very sparse. Uh, in contrast, a set of even numbers is not complete. Um, and uh, the reason is that you can't represent odd numbers. So there's this modularity constraint that needs to be satisfied uh, for completeness to hold. Um, and so there's sort of two kind of obvious reasons why a, a, a sequence might not be complete. It's, it's very sparse, it's too sparse, or um, it, it fails to satisfy some modularity constraint. And, um, and we'll see that those are kind of the, the main reasons uh, why something might fail in some stronger sense. Uh, while complete sequences are still not fully understood, entirely complete sequence has a very nice characterization. It's very simple. Um, and this is due to Ron Graham. If you have a sequence of positive integers that are uh, monotonally increasing, it's entirely complete if and only if the first element is one and the kth element minus one is at most the sum of the earlier elements. And the proof is uh, uh, very simple. The forward direction is if a k minus one is greater than the sum of the aj's for some k, uh, of the smaller aj's, then you can't represent a k minus one as the sum of elements of a because the smaller elements don't add up to be as large as a k minus one. And if you include any of the larger elements, you're greater than a k minus one. And then the other uh, directions by induction on k, and you can show that um, inductively, uh, when you just take the sum of the first j elements, uh, sorry, k elements, uh, the, the sigma of the first k elements from the sequence, you get all the positive integers from one to the sum. And uh, this is by induction from the k minus one term, you get um, all the elements from one to a to the sum of aj up to k minus one. And then you get that plus you can add a k to all of those things that are representable and you get these two intervals and they're going to cover uh, together. Their union is gonna cover the whole interval from one to the sum of the, a, um, uh, the, sum of the aj's up to k. And uh, this is part of, uh, there's some variant of this, which is a lemma of Graham that's quite useful uh, to show that sigma of a for a big sequence might be complete or contains a long interval. Um, you start off with a smaller interval. So if sigma of a contains all integers in the interval from x to x plus y, um, and if you have an integer a uh, with a less than or equal to y, when you add a to the, to the sequence a, the little a, the single element, then when you look at sigma of a together with that little a, um, you contain all integers in the interval from x all the way up to x plus y plus a. So you can grow these intervals uh, if you have small enough elements and you have already made a large enough uh, interval. And uh, you can do this inductively. So in instead of doing it with one element, you could do this if you have s positive integers and the ai is less than y plus the sum of the aj's where j is less than i, then you can grow the uh, interval from x to x plus y all the way up to from x to x plus y plus the sum of the AIs. And so uh, this is a helpful tool in proving uh, sequences complete, um, but you need a starting point where you have some long enough interval to start with that you can continue. Okay, great. Um, so that's uh, some useful things around it. entirely complete. Um, a natural question might be which polynomial sequences are complete. Uh, so let P be a polynomial in one variable and A, B, the values you get when you plug in positive integers. So um, the sequence, so for example, if P of N is X squared, this is, A is just a sequence of perfect squares. If A is complete, uh, one thing you can notice is that the leading coefficient of P has to be positive. Uh, 
Otherwise, there's only a finite number of terms in A that are positive, and so you're not going to be able to get all the positive integers. So the leading coefficient should be positive, and for every prime p, there's an n such that p does not divide p of n. Otherwise, um, you would fail this modularity constraint um, uh, mod p. Otherwise, everything, all this, all the elements of A would be multiples of p, and so would all the subset sums. Um, so these necessary conditions, uh, these two simple necessary conditions were shown to be su sufficient by Roth and Sekeres in 1959. Another uh, proof using the circle method was uh, done by Castles in 1962. It's a nice analytic proof. Um, and uh, there was an elementary proof. So these earlier proofs were analytic by, uh, by Ron Graham of this result. And uh, in fact, he, Ron Graham proved a little bit more and he gave a sort of different characterization he said, if you write the polynomial P of X as a polynomial, if it's of degree K, you can write it as alpha K times X choose K, where X choose K uh, you think of as a polynomial in degree K. So it's X times X minus one, all the way down to X minus K plus one, the product divided by K factorial. Um, and so you can write every polynomial down as a, a sum like this. And um, the sequence A is complete if and only if the leading coefficient when you write P of X in this form, alpha K is positive, and these alpha, alpha, all these alpha J's are, are um, uh, all the co alpha J's are rational, and the uh, numerators are, uh, have GCD1. Um, otherwise, you, you, you fail some modularity uh, constraint. So he got, had this nice characterization of the complete polynomial sequences. Um, now, due to the fact that completeness is a rad, rather fragile notion, Burr and Erdős in the 80s um, were studying more robust notions. And in particular, they introduced this notion of Ramsey complete sequences. Um, and so uh, it's nice to have the counting function. A of n is the, uh, is the number of Oops, my apologies, um, having some uh, screen issue. Hopefully we can get that back up. Um, sorry. Again, we're uh, share. Um, hmm. I'm having some issues. Should, should I continue now? Okay. So Bern Erdős uh, introduced a more robust notion of completeness, uh, which they called Ramsey completeness. Um, and it's helpful to have this counting function, A of N, which counts the number of elements in A up to N. And it, We'll go between sets and sequences. It's not a big difference in this problem. In these problems, um, A is called R Ramsey complete if, for every partition of A into R sets, every sufficiently large integer is in the union of the sigma of A i's. Uh, another way of saying this is if you color the elements of A with R colors, so each element of A gets a color um, from one to R then every sufficiently large integer can be written as a monochromatic subset sum. So that you can write every sufficiently large integer as a sum of elements of the same color. This is true for every partition of A um, or every coloring of A into our, our, with our colors. So this is a nice robust notion of uh, completeness, uh, this, Ramsey compl this Ramsey completeness. And um, you can't get every sufficiently large integer to be as a monochromatic subset sum in the same color. Uh, and you, you can come up with examples where you color from one, from two to the two to the i to two to the two to the i plus one, depending on the parity of i. Um, and uh, when you do this, you can check that uh, uh, this two coloring you can represent every sufficiently large positive integer as a monochromatic subset sum in that example, but um, you can't get it in the same color. Um, uh, so, so this 
this union part is, is necessary as opposed to that there is a, an eye for which every sufficiently large integer is in some in sigma of AI. Um, and uh, they proved several results about Ramsey completeness. They came up with a, a constructive sequence where they sh which was too Ramsey complete and was fairly sparse. So only log n cubed elements essentially up to, up to n. And yet whenever you two colored the elements of A, uh, you could represent every sufficiently large integer um, as a monochromatic subset sum. And uh, they also showed that if, a, if you have a two Ramsey complete sequence, um, it actually has to have at least some constant times log n squared uh, elements up to n for every sufficiently large n. And um, uh, they actually don't prove this in the paper. They say it can be done and they give a proof of a weaker result. Uh, than this. And they left several open problems, um, which they wanted to have answered. Uh, one was to improve these bounds for two colors. And um, a second uh, question they asked was to prove that there's a sparse R Ramsey complete sequence for R greater than two. So uh, they were unable to get any uh, interesting bound for three Ramsey complete sequence. Um, so somehow their, their, their proof technique really works for two colors to get us a, uh, a sequence that's Ramsey complete and sparse, but not for more than two colors. And uh, finally, they asked to determine the R Ramsey complete polynomial sequences. So which polynomial sequences are robustly complete in the sense that whenever you partition it into R sets, every sufficiently large positive integer can be represented as a sum of elements from the same, of the same color, from the same set in the partition. And uh, these problems remained open. Um, and uh, Erdish later offered uh, prizes for, for the first two problems. He offered $100 to, to improve the bounds for the first problem. And uh, for the second problem, he offered $250. Um, and uh, one of the main results I want to tell you about is uh, solves all these problems at, at once. Um, so there's one theorem that actually answers all of these questions. Um, but uh, we'll stick with the first two questions. Uh, so here's a theorem that answers the first two. Um, there exists an R Ramsey complete sequence A where the number of uh, elements in the sequence up to N is at most a constant times R times log N squared for all N. On the other hand, um, there's another positive absolute constant little c so that if A is a any R Ramsey complete sequence, then A of N, has to be at least CR times log n squared for all R gen. So um, this really tells you uh, how sparse a, an R Ramsey complete sequence can be. And this answers the, the first two questions. Um, the, uh, the following answers the third question um, and does even more. So this actually answers all three problems at once. If you have a degree D polynomial P um, for it to be R Ramsey, complete, it certainly will have to be complete. So assume it's a complete sequence. Um, then not only is it, the sequence complete, but then there's actually a sparse subsequence of it, um, which is as sparse as possible. So at the up to n, it only has some constant in d times r times log n squared elements, such that for all n, uh, for all n such that uh, the sequence a is actually not only is it uh, complete, but it's R Ramsey complete. So you can get this very sparse subsequence, which is R Ramsey complete. And as a corollary, if you have a complete sequence of uh, polynomial sequence, it's actually R Ramsey complete for all uh, R. So it's, it's robustly uh, R Ramsey complete. Um, and uh, I wanna tell you a little bit about the, the proof ideas behind this. Um, so uh, the key lemma to prove this, this theorem that there's a sparse R Ramsey complete sequence um, actually is a, a density version of the result. It tells you that um, if you're given an epsilon, which is between zero and a half, and N is sufficiently large, there's gonna be a subset between N to two N, which is pretty sparse. It only has roughly log N elements, and there's some dependence on epsilon, some constant over epsilon in front, um, such that, any subset a prime of this SN with at least an epsilon times the size of SN elements 
um, has the property that uh, from yn to 3yn, uh, you'll have all the elements there in sigma of a prime. So any subset a prime with an epsilon fraction of this set uh, contains this very long interval in sigma of a prime. And this y sub n is a constant times n times log n. So you get this very long interval as everything in that interval and subset sums in a prime. And the question is, how do you find such an SN or how do you show such an SN exists? Um, and uh, the second question is, how does this key lemma imply the theorem? So let's, let's see that part first. Uh, if you apply the key lemma with epsilon equals one over R and N equals two to the I for each I, that's at least some I naught, some constant. Um, and then we're gonna let A be the union of these intervals, um, of these subsets of these dyadic intervals. So um, for each, between each consecutive power of two, you, you would find roughly log n elements and this, this SN and you take the union of these um, subsets. Now consider an R coloring of the set A. Uh, this gives you a, an R coloring of each uh, of these S two to the I's. And um, we're gonna pick out the color class from S2 to the I that's as dense as possible. And we're gonna call that AI. That's the most common color. Now, there's only our colors, so it has relative density in S2 two to the I uh, of one over R, which is our choice of epsilon. So this AI is a subset, which is fairly dense, at least a one over R fraction. And therefore, um, this entire interval from Y sub two to the I to three times Y sub two to the I uh, covers uh, all the, uh, uh, covers, um, sorry, so, so that interval has a property that I sub I is in sigma of, of AI by the key lemma, and further you can check that these intervals actually cover all sufficiently large integers. Um, this is a, something that's fairly easy to check, this, this first part of this, this claim. And so, um, you get all of these intervals as monochromatic subset sums, which aren't necessarily in the same color, um, and we know that that's gonna be uh, the case. So how do we prove this key lemma? So this key lemma from the key lemma, the theorem is pretty simple. And so really the, the essence of this whole thing is the key lemma. And um, in combinatorics, one of the, the natural things to do is to try to build a, a set at random. This is a very common tool. It's part of the probabilistic method in combinatorics. So you'd like to pick a, the set SN at random um, and uh, but you don't do it in the most obvious way. So if you picked a random subset of say n to 2n, half of the elements are going to be even roughly. And if you took a prime to be the even elements, then if you, know, you had epsilon with say a third, um, a prime would not contain a whole interval and it's uh, sigma of a prime would not contain a, a long interval because it would only contain even numbers. So we have to skew away from a prime, from, from SN having a lot of elements with small factors. Um, and so we're gonna pick SN uniformly at random of the given size that we'd like it to be so that no element of SN has a prime factor less than log N divided by two. And uh, uh, so um, among the elements from N to two N with no small prime factor, you're gonna pick the, SN to be uh, a subset of that uniformly at random. And then um, you check that a random A prime of that given size 4,000 log N and each element has no small prime factor satisfies with very high probabilities uh, that YN to three YN is gonna be a subset of sigma of A prime. So this is really the, the heart of the proof um, and this very high probability is actually uh, very high. <laughs> it's, it's, it's very unlikely that a random A prime will have this property so unlikely that you can union bound uh, when you take this SN over all of the subsets of size epsilon times SN. So we can union bound over all the choices of A prime and uh, show that with positive probability SN has the property. So it's, it's a random set, but it's uh, picked so that it doesn't have any small prime factors because we don't, we wanna avoid the modularity issues that can come up. Okay, any questions about this? Um, so there's details to this proof that I'm uh, glossing over about how you show with very high probability. Um, there are interesting uh, uh, things there, but the, the, the main idea 
is, is sort of all here. <laughs> um, and um, the, uh, there's a general sort of idea here that we use actually to solve a lot of questions about subset sums. So this is one example, these Ramsey completeness, where you can uh, say a lot of things about subset sums. Um, so uh, a general way of building a large interval in a subset. So, so we have a set A of integers and we like to say sigma of A contains some long interval. That's the goal. And uh, how we go about this is we partition the set A into L sets. L here will usually be a constant even. So you just partition into A1 to AL. Sometimes you do this in a careful way. Many times it's not, you don't have to be that careful with this. And then you partition each of these sets AI into two sets, BI and CI, so that the set of subset sums of BI is large modulo each element from CI. And uh, there's some work in that step in, in each of these applications. And using the previous step, uh, we get that sigma of A prime is large. In fact, it's dense in some interval. And that using that each of these sigma of AIs is large, we get that their subset sum and uh, hence sigma of A contains a long interval. And this uses a, um, to get this long interval from dense subsets uses a nice lemma of Lev. Um, so, uh, and for the step three, uh, one helpful tool is uh, a very simple claim that we think is new, but somehow uh, it's incredibly useful in this, and it's very simple. If you have a positive integer C and you have a subset B of integers with C not an element of B, and the size of sigma of A consider modulo C, so you just look at which modularity classes contain at least one element, is at least H, so you have at least H non-empty moduli classes, then sigma of A union C is at least the size of sigma of A plus H, because in each of these modularity classes, when you add C, you're going to get at least one more additional element uh, in sigma of A um, when you add C to it. Okay. And this is the this lemma of Lev, which is helpful for step four. If you have a bunch of subsets, A1 to AL of integers, and each of the AIs has size at least N, and each AI is a subset of an interval with at most Q plus one elements, and L is large, at least roughly Q over N. Um, and none of these AIs is a subset of an arithmetic progression of common difference greater than one, so it really doesn't lie in some congruence class, non-trivial congruence class, then um, the sum of the AIs uh, of these subset sums, so you look a1 plus a2 all the way plus al it's adding one element from all the possible it's a set of all the possible ways of adding one element from each of the ais this sub this sum set contains an interval of length at least l times n minus one plus one so it allows you to go from rather dense subsets of an interval to uh getting an entire interval and this it's a very useful lemma for what we're doing here okay um so another example of a variant on these completeness, we saw these coloring results and a natural analog analogous thing to look at is density type results. And so um, you can ask if a, a set A is epsilon, you would naturally call a set A epsilon complete if every subset A prime of A with A prime of N, at least an epsilon fraction of A of N for N sufficiently large is complete. That is you have a set A and A prime is a subsequence of A so that um, up to N, you get at least an epsilon fraction of the elements of A. Um, whenever you have such a subset or subsequence, um, if it's always complete, then, then you call the original set A epsilon complete. So this is a density notion. And uh, this is reminiscent of in additive combinatorics, there's a, a famous theorem of van der Veerden that whenever you finitely color the positive integers, there's always an arbitrarily long arithmetic progression. Um, there's a, a strengthening of this known as Samaretti's theorem that uh, every dense set of positive integers contains arbitrarily long arithmetic progressions. And so this is a, a natural density analog of these completeness questions that we, these Ramsey completeness questions. And a, a natural question here is how sparse can an epsilon complete sequence be? And uh, as we uh, discovered earlier, there has to be these modularity and growth conditions. Um, and, and in this epsilon complete problem, for each prime P, the multiples of P and A have to have density at most epsilon. Otherwise, we could 
take the subset A prime to be the multiples of P and A, and uh, we would, that would not be complete. And um, there also has to be some, some growth condition. And um, this growth condition tells us that for every, uh, that there's a C such that when you take uh, the, a, the element AK has to be at most the sum of the very small terms, um, the first epsilon K plus C AIs, um, uh, that, that this has to hold. Uh, so that it doesn't grow too quickly. And, um, and what we show is actually, if you take a random sequence satisfying the modularity and growth conditions that are necessary, it, it, it has to, then it's almost surely epsilon complete. Um, and in particular, there's a theorem that characterizes how sparse an epsilon complete sequence can be, that um, uh, there's some sequence where FM is, uh, you take to be the sum of the FIs, where I is at most epsilon M, and uh, if A is epsilon complete, then AK has to grow uh, at most some constant times FK. The constant will can depend on, on the A, the sequence itself. Um, and then there's an epsilon complete sequence A with, uh, with, that grows as, uh, as quickly as these FKs. Now these FKs, um, they grow faster than polynomial. So the k th grows faster than polynomial. It's roughly like k to the log k uh, growth. Um, around uh, these sort of completeness questions, uh, one can ask if the following generalization of Birch's uh, theorem holds. Um, so uh, Birch's theorem is the case that r equals one. If you have r plus one pairwise relatively prime integers that are greater than one, um, is it true that the sequence of, uh, of uh, products of powers of these r plus one integers is Ramsey r complete? And you can show that it's not Ramsey r plus one complete. And there's a fairly interesting looking uh, coloring that works for that. Um, to show this. So I'll leave this uh, uh, here, which um, you assign the color, a color J for which I J is non-zero and J is at most R. Or if your product is not of that form, then it just has to be a power of the, uh, the last one, PR plus one. And then you can color those ones with color R plus one. And those are too sparse to actually be, uh, to get you enough elements. And there's not, uh, and the other ones, for modularity reasons, you don't cover, cover more than a constant density of the positive integers. Um, and so you can put it all together and you will have missing integers uh, that can't be represented as a monochromatic subset sum in this R plus one coloring. But it's likely R complete, Ramsey R complete. And, um, and so that's what this conjecture is. And I think it's a natural problem still here um, that we left open. Um, instead of trying to get all sufficiently large monochromatic integers, you could uh, alternatively just try to target a certain integer. Let's say you wanted to get the number n as a monochromatic subset sum. And this is a problem that Erdős and uh, Alone and others and Van Vu um, have studied. Uh, so a natural definition is let f of n be the minimum r such that there's an r coloring of the positive integers less than n such that no monochromatic subset sums to n. So you're coloring um, the numbers uh, less than n. So as an example, um, if n is 23 here, here's a coloring with three colors of the positive integers up to 22. And you can check that amongst the red elements, they just don't add up enough to, uh, to get to 23. You can't represent 23 as a sum of distinct red elements. You also can't represent 23 as a sum of distinct blue elements. Um, and the, the green elements, uh, each one of them is less than 23, but whenever you add two of them, you get larger than 23. So uh, you, one can check that this uh, shows that f of 23 is at most three. Um, and uh, this was not a, a, a very complicated coloring. This was a greedy coloring where you color the smallest positive integer, uh, each positive integer, the smallest color for which um, uh, you can possibly color it. And this, this greedy coloring uses roughly square root of n over two colors, you can check. 
Um, however, this is not close to best possible. There's actually a considerably better coloring. Instead of square root of n, roughly, um, the right exponent is a third. Uh, and Erdős first proved that f of n is little o of n to the one third, and asked if actually the right exponent is a third. Um, and this was uh, solved by Alon and Erdős in the mid 90s. Um, they showed upper and lower bounds on this f of n, the minimum number of colors, which is roughly like n to the one third, um, although there's logarithmic factor differences in the lower and upper bound. They're roughly off by a factor of log n between the lower and upper bound. You see the exponent of log n in the lower bound and the denominator is four thirds. And then the upper bound, it's only one third. And there's an extra log log n factor. Um, and so they're off by uh, roughly a log n factor. And they asked to, to close the gap between um, the lower and upper bound, they even conjecture that the upper bound is closer to the truth. Um, uh, and Vu improved the lower bound, uh, bringing the exponent from four thirds to one. Um, and recently uh, using these techniques and some additional tools that we saw from the Ramsey completeness, uh, we uh, actually determined F of N up to an absolute constant factor. Um, it looks like a complicated formula here. It's uh, n to the one third. And then similar to the upper bound, we have this log n to the one third. Uh, and we also have a log log n to the two thirds. And in the numerator, there's this factor n over phi of n. Phi of n here is the Euler's Toten function, which is um, uh, n over phi of n is greater than one, but it's always at most log log n. And it's for typical n, if you take a random n, it's going to usually be a, 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 like a constant. But for n, uh, n that's very has a lot of factors, it can uh, um, it can be all the way up to log log n and um, a lot of small factors. Uh, and so the alone Erdős bound upper bound is actually correct only for those uh, up to a constant factor for for um, those n for which they have many small prime, uh, prime factors. Um, and uh, for larger, for, for most n, it's off by a factor of roughly log n, um, the alone Erdős bound. And uh, there's a rather involved coloring uh, that shows that uh, the, this is the alone Erdős coloring that gives us the, um, the upper bound. Uh, so there's three types of colors he uses, they use. Uh, you color from an, the interval from n over j plus one to n over j in color j, for j being one to r over two. And this colors all the large elements, like things bigger than two n over r, um, you can color with half the colors. And then with uh, r over four color, additional colors, you can color all the multiples of small primes. So for every, for each of the first, uh, R over four small primes P, you can color the multiples of P using one color and you'll, um, and these primes P, sorry, that do not divide N so that the multiples of P will never be N. Um, and finally, you can group the remaining uncolored elements into R over four color classes, each with some less than N. There are not so many of these additional elements and they're all at most two N over R. And so uh, when you put this all together, if you choose R appropriately, you get that you can't write N as a monochromatic subset sum with these three types of color classes. And this uh, is close to optimal for some N, but not in, in, for most N. Um, and uh, there's a more involved coloring um, that we come up with that works for, uh, for um, for all n, and um, it basically uses the same uh, as the first two types of colors, but there's uh, a more careful thing to do for the last uh, type of colors, um, and uh, uh, using some more number theoretic properties. It, it's a little bit wasteful just to group them so that their sum is less than n. You should actually be looking at some modularity uh, constraints here. Okay. Um, I'll uh, finish with uh, uh, one more interesting uh, application of these techniques. Uh, this is, uh, there's a famous problem that was solved by Samaradi and Vu. It was an old question of Erdős and Moser. Uh, 
Um, and they proved the following result, which helped them prove this result of Erd this conjecture of Erdős and Moser, that if you have a subset of the positive integers from one to n, and it has size at least a constant times root n, then sigma of a contains an n-term arithmetic progression. So this is a very nice result of samurai Vu. It's very useful. Um, and uh, um, there was a, almost a strengthening of this result, which uh, allows you to get something called a homogeneous uh, arithmetic progression, which is an uh, even stronger property. So an arithmetic progression is homogeneous if um, the common difference divides, divides the first term. And Freiman and Sarkozy proved that if you have a subset of one to n that contains at least a constant times root n log n, then sigma of a contains an n term homogeneous arithmetic progression. Um, and so there was still this, this logarithmic factor. These results were done independently by Freiman and Sarkozy, and their proofs are actually quite different, although they got essentially the same bound. Um, and uh, Sarkozy and even Freiman mentioned something along these lines, and Tran and Vu, Vu and Wood and others uh, asked whether there was a common strengthening of both of these that um, you can get rid of the log factor in the Freiman Sarkozy result that not only do you get an n term arithmetic progression, but you get an n term homogeneous arithmetic progression. It's not simply that in itself it's a stronger result, but actually there's a lot of applications of this Freiman Sarkozy result. And, um, all these applications would carry over with better bounds if, uh, if this conjecture holds. And so developing uh, these techniques, we proved this theorem and consequently we could uh, uh, prove many uh, further things about subset sums using and variants of these problems um, using this uh, result. So uh, I'll finish here, thank you. Um, thanks, thanks a lot, Jacob. Thanks. Questions, observations, remarks? So the, we have a, a paper, the three of us, uh, where all these results and, and more are, uh, are in. It's about 70 uh, pages, it's on the archive. Um, so it's Hoi Pham, David Conlon and myself, and we've been working on this actually for a few years. Uh, and we also have some follow-up papers um, on this topic. So. Uh, um, yeah, there seems to be a lot that one can, can be done in this area, and there's some interesting other problems still to be done here. I don't know if we have some question. You, you show some interesting conjectures and open problems. What do you think about uh, which will be the next one to be solved? Uh, yeah, so, um, well, there's a, a paper we're, we're finishing up right now um, where we prove a, high, higher dimensional ver uh, a higher dimensional version of this result. So here you see that there's an exponent of a half um, and uh, in fact, you can get much sparser sets, but instead of getting homogeneous arithmetic progressions, you get something called a, a d-dimensional, um, homo uh, homogeneous d-dimensional arithmetic progression, which is uh, a little bit weaker in terms of there's a uh, notion here, but um, uh, anyway, so there's some variants on this that are, are, are useful uh, for other problems, and we uh, extend this. And um, there's a famous theorem of Roth that if you uh, have a dense subset of one to n, then it contains a three term arithmetic progression, which the middle term is the average of the other two terms. And there are variants of these problems like, um, can you, how dense of a subset of one to n can you get so that no element is in the average of a set of other elements from your set? So for Roth's theorem, it's saying there's three terms, one which is an average of two others, but in general, you could ask maybe you'd like no element to be the average of any other subset. And um, uh, what's known is there's a lower bound, which is roughly n to the quarter. Uh, there was an upper bound, which was square root of n log n, which uses this Freiman Sarkozy result. Um, using this theorem, we were able to get constant times root n. Uh, 
Uh, so n to the one half without the log n, but with these additional ideas, we've been able to bring the exponent down to square root of two minus one. And we're still working to try to see if a quarter may be the right bound or not. So I, I think that's a very nice question that's it's been studied for more than 50 years, whether um, if you have a subset of one to n with no subset being the average of the elements of no subset being one of your other elements of your sequence or, or from your set, then um, how large can that set A be? Um, and uh, I, I very much like that problem and uh, we're working on that. And there's other questions around polynomials like, like squares um, that we're working on as well. Uh, so I think there's a lot of great questions in these uh, completeness and Ramsey completeness. Um, the, the hardness that comes from the uh, questions around like Goldbach conjecture, um, uh, they don't appear, those hardness issues don't appear in these sorts of questions. Oftentimes you're not adding up a constant number of terms, but rather something like a, a logarithmic number of terms. And um, so some of those things get smoothed out. Uh, so there the different sort of issues arise in these completeness type questions rather than the questions that um, Goldbach and, and Gauss were looking at uh, a long time ago. Thanks, Jacob. Some other question? 